I'm Phil Bolton with the Global Atlanta News Service, and today I'm with Dr. Paul Dalby, uh, who is the research coordinator for the International Center of Excellence in Water Resources Management from Adelaide, Australia. Welcome. Thank you very much, Phil. Tell us, how bad can global drought get? In Australia, we've, um, we've had the experience where we've had a, a very serious drought over the last 10 years. Um, we've had farmers walking off the land in some of our dry land areas. Most major capital cities in Australia are on uh, some form of water restrictions, most of them quite severe. Um, many of our capital cities ran down their water storages to a level where um, it was very, very serious and they've had to implement very strict water restrictions. In, in South Australia, where I live, in the state of South Australia, our irrigators are currently on 18% allocations, which means they're allowed to use 18% of their water entitlement um, to irrigate. And so if you're a, a, a farmer who's growing a perennial crop, that's a really significant challenge. I take it uh, there's not much of a debate anymore in terms of climate change. There really isn't in Australia. 85% um, uh, of the population um, believe very strongly in climate change. They want the government to do something about it. They don't want to have the debate anymore. Um, it's going to... Uh, every state government and the federal government is developing a strategy to adapt to climate change as well as to try and reduce greenhouse emissions. And uh, it's, really, it's really the debate is over. There, there are a few people who still argue uh, against climate change being human induced anyway. Um, I don't think many people dispute climate change. Some of them might dispute its cause. Did the uh, government pick up the challenge? Um, it's interesting. The, in, I think the big shift in attitude in Australia came in about 2006 and um, uh, one political party picked up that change in mood before the other one and probably helped them win, a, win an election on, as a result. Um, the, the political the political will now in Australia um, is very strongly focused towards adapting to and addressing climate change. One of the first things the new federal government did in, once it was elected was to sign the Kyoto Protocol. Um, it was almost its first act of government and it's now um, very busily investing in research, um, subsidising industry to help it adapt to climate change. There's a wide range of programs for farmers and manufacturers and, and even for people um, uh, constructing buildings. To, to build low energy um, businesses um, and for farmers to help them adapt to, to the to problems of climate change. Have uh, these problems uh, initiated private sector initiatives? Uh, it certainly has. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a wide range of investment, um, new startup companies in renewable energy systems. Um, you, you, you wouldn't build an office tower in Australia now without it being five star energy rated because you wouldn't get customers. Um, different businesses compete on how energy efficient their, their buildings are and like to brag about it um, in, uh, when they get together in networking forums. So, so business has really taken up the challenge and um, investors have taken up the challenge in, in trying to address this, this major problem that we have. In terms of your farming sector, have there been uh, noticeable changes in the last couple of years? There certainly has. Uh, there are some areas where farmers have just walked off the land. It's been in drought for so long that they've just given up and they've just left. Um, even, even with the offer of, of drought relief, they've just, you know, they've just walked away. We've, I talked about our irrigators in South Australia. They're on 18% um, water allocations. Uh, what some of those farmers have done is close to miraculous. Some of them have maintained their, their profitability as farmers in, time when, in times where they've had 18% of their water allocation or 30% of their water allocation last year. And this is because of um, the, the flexibility of, of, of water trading in Australia where farmers can trade water between, between farmers. And, uh, and so farmers have been able to buy in water if they've, if they've needed extra water. They've implemented um, uh, strenuous water saving measures, they've mulched their soils to stop evaporation, they've put their, their irrigation systems underground to irrigate subsurface to save water in that way. Um, they've uh, maybe taken out some areas of crops which were, which were minimal profitable or low profitable and they were able to do that because they have, um, uh, they have 
put sensors throughout their property so that they know how much water they're applying, how much yield they're getting off different areas. So they've got a lot of information they can use to make decisions on where am I getting the best bang for my buck, where am I best putting my water. This water, water trading uh, system, has that been put in place uh, fairly recently or um, is there a, a longer history there? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a reasonably recent phenomenon. It's required a major reform in policy in Australia. So first of all, you had to um, implement metering. You had to unbundle land title from water title. So in, in our major irrigation area, the Murray-Darling Basin, which includes a number of our major rivers, Murray River and the Darling River, um, the water title was separated from the land title so that you could then trade your water within that catchment, within a connected catchment. Then you had to have the systems in place to allow the trade. So each state government has had to implement systems to allow people to, to physically trade that water entitlement up and down the river. And that's been put in place in the last couple of years? In the last, in the last decade, I'd say. That's in the last in decade. Yeah. Is it a well-known system now globally? Um, globally, I think it's, uh, people are coming to Australia to learn about it. Um, we get lots of international visitors coming, you know, ministers for water and CEOs of water utilities and water departments coming to see how we've done this. Um, we haven't done it in a perfect way by any means. We've made lots of mistakes and there's lots of things to learn from, from how we've done it, both the good things and the bad things that we've done. From the people that we've spoken to in America, our message is Australia is where America could be in a few years' time and you don't know when that's going to happen. You don't know when climate change might hit um, and you get that step change in climate that Australia experienced. Uh, and so there's a lot to learn from Australia. You can be forewarned and forearmed about how to deal with that issue when it arrives um, and perhaps not go through so much of the pain that we had to go through in Australia. Well, tell us more about the step change. Uh, what kind of time frame are we talking about? You're talking about one or two years where the climate shifts from, from one rainfall pattern to a, to a different rainfall pattern. Um, and so, for example, Perth was the city in Australia that experienced this climate change first, per perhaps back in the 70s and 80s. Um, rainfall dropped off about 14%, I think, on average, for about 20 years. And that resulted in a, a drop off in run for, um, and runoff of perhaps 45%, 30, 30 to 45%. So in Australia, it seems that a 1% decline in rainfall results in a 3 to 4% decline in runoff. And so um, they experienced that first step change. They've experienced another since. So they're now down to 33% of what they were getting as rainfall 30, 40 years ago. And, uh, and so they've built their first desalination plant. They're now about to build their second. In the eastern part of Australia, we've experienced our, our step change in rainfall over within the last decade and, uh, and have had to scramble to, to make changes to how we manage water in that time. We're now uh, looking at uh, water recycling as a major part of our, our water supply. Um, looking very heavily at demand management, how can we increase our efficiency in water use? Because even if it rains again in Australia, and it will rain again, even if we haven't experienced a climate shift, even if climate change never happens, our population is going to increase. And at some, some stage, we're going to put our water resources under pressure again. And by very simple changes in how we manage our water and very sensible improvements in water use efficiency, which, to be honest, increase the profitability of, of the organisations who implement them. Um, you extend your water supply you know, further into the future, it delays major capital investments, and it's just smart, smart financial management as well as smart water management.